So we have uh, our first conversation on Zoom uh, during this amazing time of pandemic coronavirus time. So if you guys don't mind, I'd like to uh, start by just a quick introduction so everybody knows who you all are. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna start with you. Rachel Brenton, I played at Sky Blue FC 2013 to 2017 um, for the in the NWSL. I uh, went to Villanova and Rutgers and got my um, double majored in psych and English. Very nice. Coach Lou? Um, I'm Lou Arsenault. I'm from New Brunswick, Canada. First language is French. I went to school in Alabama. Um, I played pro in California and then pro in Finland. Um, coached in California as well. My major was, well, my undergrad was athletic training and my major was athletic administration with the minor in TESOL, teaching English as a second language. I know. And this is Manu Apelius. I have been a club coach and director for the last 12 years, a club coach for 20 years, club director in the Los Angeles area for the last 12 years, uh, high school coach. I've uh, uh, been doing high school and uh, club coaching for the last 20 years, basically. That's my livelihood. I'm a full time yes. coach. Awesome. So, one of the first thing I would like to uh, bring up is how did you all get into coaching and why? So, Manu, let's start with you. Well, it's a funny story. I moved to California, to Los Angeles in 92 to pursue a career as a musician. I played drums. Uh, I played my entire club soccer career in Italy. Uh, played at a high level in Italy, although never turned pro. And um, coaching was the last thing uh, in my thoughts. And uh, I started coaching completely by accident because a friend asked me to help him run a little YMCA team, a little spring league for a YMCA in Los Angeles. And um, as I started doing that with a certain degrees of success, people started asking me to uh, run soccer camps and run uh, and do private lessons. And then I started coaching at YSO, which led to high school, which led to club. And all of a sudden, something that wasn't even uh, uh, an afterthought for me became a career. And uh, once I realized that music really wasn't taking off as a career and that uh, soccer could actually become a, a good way to turn one of my passions into a main job, I started doing the whole uh, coaching courses, you know, the, the whole licensing process with the U.S. Uh, Federation and whatnot. And within a few years, it turned into a full-time job and I never looked back. And I've been doing it uh, ever since. Nice. Lou? Very cool. Um, I started my coaching career um, as a graduate assistant. Um, my master's degree was paid for by the school, so I got to coach three years collegiately in Mississippi. Um, so after that, I started working some camps, uh, and I worked camps in California and for, for a gentleman, and he really liked what I was doing, and then he offered me a job. So right after my master's degree, um, I accepted you know, a position into youth coaching. So, I mean, I've always been involved in the sport. I used to come back to Canada and run my own camps out here um, just as a way to give back to the community and just kind of use the medium of the sport that's done so much for me to teach life lessons and to, you know, really make an impact in the youth development. So that's kind of how I've been kind of led into that. And I've been coaching um, in the youth or just coaching in general for the last, I think, six, six, seven years. So. Yeah. Rachel, what about you? Um, I stumbled upon it. I, as you might know, um, in the end of your cell, we don't get paid that much, um, more now than in the beginning. So it was just ancillary stuff. I was doing that. I was doing marketing. I was adding a lot of things to my, my load. And I was just asked, um, you know, my dad coached me and, um, uh, he's still coaching in New Jersey. And I just decided to, you know, try it. You know, I had a couple of people that would ask for privates and then I get, grew, grew into uh, 
being associated with teams and that got into being associated with academy teams and um, strength and conditioning in, in that field. So I kind of just kept going. I don't know if I will continue, but it is, it is, uh, it has been interesting. So I've been doing that since uh, 2010, I believe. That's good. So you all kind of got the bug almost by accident, it sounds like. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so Definitely was looks good. like coaching chooses you right <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that's kind of like i feel like it is for me even though obviously film is always going to be my number one i right. i have to admit that it is it is a lot of fun uh, it's crazy but it's a lot of fun um it kind of grows on you doesn't it <laughs> yeah 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 um so it, it, i think it's at least for me it does it feels like it becomes quickly a passion uh, because it's something that you can, I mean, I guess some people do, but uh, if you want to do it right, you can't just kind of do it half and half. You have to commit to do it. Whether mm -hmm. you get paid or you don't get paid, you either really sit and do it or might as well do something else, right? What do you guys think? I mean, I would agree with that, but I don't know that everybody does that. So I think that uh, that's the right mindset, um, but I don't know that that's really realistic for everyone. That's my personal opinion. Yes, you're right. <laughs> and I think that's where we're having so many problems, don't we? Yeah. Um, it's a difficult proposition because if you want to do it full time, you really need to have a lot of different gigs and mm -hmm. you need to be able to manage the different gigs. Mm -hmm. You know, very few jobs in the United States will allow you to make a full time living just with that, uh, that one coaching position mm -hmm. so you need to be able to get several gigs manage to uh, you know uh, manage them and uh, and then you can make a living I see a lot of coaches that either do it as a as a hobby they have a full-time job and then they do a little uh, coaching on the side which gives them a little extra cash but they don't seem to be that um, involved and that engaged into the, the career uh, to really invest in their in their education and, and in the advancement of their career. Or I see a lot of coaches that try to do it full time, but it's not as easy because of the reasons that I described earlier. You know? So that means that we have a lot of coaches like Lou just mentioned that for one reason or another are not really investing as much as they should into, into the career. I'm going to add something onto what you're saying, Manu. Like, I think what happens with the coaching world too is in order for us to make a living, kind of like what you said, you need to be coaching more than one team. So now you're looking at two, at least three, at least four teams, right? To enable to be able to sustain yourself. So there comes a time where we become kind of like thinned out, right? So you're not, you can't focus as much energy as you could on one team with backing up with that financial stability, right? So now we're spread across a wider field, a lot wider range. So I think that that's why sometimes it impacts some of the teams that we're coaching. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I yeah. think that um, and it depends on your development per team, you know, what's going oh. on, you know, what age group, are they all the same age group? Um, are they all the same talent level? And I think what, you know, I discussed with you, Joel, um, like, uh, you know, there's a lot of parents that we deal with, a lot of other external parties that could get in the way. And oh. essentially, yeah, and like what you said, um, we, you know, there's, um, there has to be a return of investment, you know, um, and sometimes you can't get that. And sometimes it'll be either the kids are adapting and they're truly developing or, you know what, maybe they they kind of are, but at least you're getting paid to do and put in the time and the effort. And most times, and I think, you know, uh, to your point, Manu, um, it's a rarity to find someone that's going to be truly all in if those things aren't met. And we do find the watered down, burnt out, kind of juggling, having so many facets that it's essentially kind of tough to, it takes a superhuman to really be like that into it. It has to be their passion. And I see that all the time. I see coaches that are like, I always wanted to coach. This is what I do. And no matter what, give me the one, give me the players that are great. Give me the players that aren't so good. And let me just build because that's my, you know, vocation. And then you have these other um coaches that you know they're like and I, I would consider myself sometimes one where I'm discouraged because you know I'm putting in all this effort 
and these kids can't even go out and just juggle. You know, there's suddenly the simple things. So why would I write a huge packet of like fitness and things and clips to watch and games to watch when the parents and the kids don't really care? Yeah, that's fair. You need to be patient and find the right situation, which sometimes uh, it takes years to stumble upon. You know, reality. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you guys have had experience as directors. I've been a club director for the last 12 years and I guarantee you that in order to be a good director and also need and also make a living means that you need to coach some teams so in order to coach your teams well in order to do a good job as a director and everything that goes together with it you have to work uh, incredible hours so you have to have that dedication you have to have that drive I found myself in jobs where I work 14 hours a day, seven days a week for nine months straight. And you can complain if you want to stay in this line of work, you have to be able to do it. And as you said, sometimes the return is not even that great because sometimes you're dealing with uh, families and kids that are not as driven and are not. A, but there are those kind of experiences out there there it's mm -hmm. just a matter of it being sometimes you gotta have be lucky to be in the right situation sometimes you have to go and look for them but i do believe that it can be done uh, i think of myself as somebody who has done it for a long time with all the frustration that comes with the job and i'm sure we'll talk about the many things that are not working out in this business right now in this country but it can be done but it requires an exceptional amount of patience and perseverance that that's for sure so one of the things that what do you think can be done realistically or at least you know slowly build on it to make that situation less of a problem for people that want to coach because one of the big uh things that a lot of people always talk about is how you know especially at the youth level but i would argue that i don't really know if there are that many great coaches uh in soccer in the higher levels either um how do we work that uh when the money's so little how do we get people to coach, uh, more talented coaches to stay with us and stay with programs, start programs? Uh, is there something that we can do about it? Well, I think it's also getting the, I think we could, what could be better right now is figuring out, and may, maybe it's just per organization, but I think sometimes organizations throw words like develop or persevere or determination or whatever and they don't have uh their values in order so and now right now what we're dealing with is organizations trying to like it's not all soccer and it's not all business they try to have to you know keep it in between if you're all business you lose the business if you're all soccer you lose the soccer and the business mm -hmm. so it's it you have to bring in revenue so especially like here in new jersey we can't just have teams of just 13 you know, a lot of these academy teams will actually be broken down. So I understand that business point. But I think that if you stick to your value, let's say it is creating the most pristine driven athletes, like what Barcelona would do, um, then that means that we would have to take those cuts. And then in addition, find those coaches that are actually, you know, credited that do have the background and they're being observed you know i don't know a lot of places that they actually watch at least over here on the east coast like not a lot of like oh well we've checked in we check in we see their sessions we're doing education mm -hmm. um we are putting the right coaches with the right age groups with the right personnel um like for me as a coach myself i'm not a screamer but a lot of organizations are like you got to get to this you got to scream you got to do this and that does it that's already a divide mm -hmm. on the psyche of you know the age group the personnel and everything and i think that is kind of not really eye to eye and that could create this kind of going on which then people jump around like crazy i also think that it depends on what the age group is i mean not this is separate from what you were just saying i think right. this is more like joel's answer uh my answer to Joel's question, I think that to help develop that like passion and to help develop that like growth in players, I think there needs to be a solid foundation where 
the kids are not driven to just learn how to win. So a lot of times at the youth level, um, you'll see coaches say like, oh yeah, but we lost. And like they're laying into, I mean, I've seen it time and time again. And these kids are like six, seven, eight, nine, right? So we want to create an environment, in my opinion, where kids can thrive and they learn how to like deal with adversity now because what's going to happen in the real world is not everything is going to be handed to them so now we're learning to teach these kids life lessons through the medium of the sport and it's creating a foundation where they're actually loving to come to practice loving the sport now if we can build that foundation strong enough as they're growing up the system right they're going to become better players because they're going to be more passionate about the sport and then what that's going to lead is going to be more confident confident leads to increased knowledge and then increased desire to learn and then it's going to help grow the team but i think it really needs to start from the bottom and you know youth coaches at the really younger age i think have a bigger responsibility into building longer term players as far as like to the love of the game and the passion of the game and don't get me wrong there are players that love the game and they're not just they are just not there as players and that's i'm not talking about them yeah i'm talking about the majority of players that you know really thrive and put in the work to get to where they really want to go i think you're touching up on a lot of important uh, concepts uh, to me it's not that important uh the style of a coach to me what matters is the content of the coach is the that. message that you're delivering i have met exceptional coaches who were screamers and I've met exceptional coaches who were very quiet and very soft-spoken. And I've met incredibly mediocre coaches who were soft-spoken and incredibly mediocre coaches who were, who were yellers or, you know, who were loud. Um, to me, as you said, Lou, it's about creating the passion for the game, especially for the young kids, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and there are different ways of doing it. The important thing is to, you know, bring the, the correct message up, right. you know, make the right coaching points uh, um, and create that passion for the game. Rachel, you mentioned development, which to me right now is one of the most abused words in this business. Everybody talks about development. Nobody does development. Yeah. Development is the last thought. You mentioned about this being a business earlier. And I can tell you that at least for what I'm witnessing here in, in Southern California, a lot of the bigger clubs, the bigger they are and the higher the level they are, the worse their coaches are. Because it becomes a business where, you know, anybody who's the minimal, uh, you know, whoever has the, a minimal level of experience who can do the job with the lowest possible mm -hmm. salary is who ends up getting the job. So a lot of clubs are really not focusing on development. Development is the last thing on their thought. It's a business. And this is to me, I, I, this is what I, I consider one of the biggest uh, shortcomings of American soccer right now. It has become a business model where everybody needs to make money. And in order to make money, you need to cut corners. You need to have the cheapest possible empl uh, em em employees. You need to, uh, yeah. And that is not conducive to a good development program. You're not going to develop the best soccer players that you can be if you give the kids uh, the cheapest possible coach and, uh, and if everything is about making money. And this is something that I'm struggling with because people like me, like us, who make a living with this business, we also make a living because this is a business that is based on the pay-to-play model. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, if it wasn't pay to play and it was, if it was open and free for everybody and a lot more kids have the opportunity to play at the highest level in club soccer, then maybe this wouldn't be a job for a lot of us. Anymore. Mm -hmm. And I really struggle with that because I cannot find a solution that allows for us to go back to real development, real development that is accessible to everyone and that is not based on making money and that is not based on a lot of people needing to to make a living with it. So I, I really struggle to find a solution uh, for that. But right now we are a system that is based on making money mm -hmm. and development is really the last of the concerns of a lot of programs out there. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it's a big problem, obviously. Especially on the male side, you're seeing a lack of quality players being produced, which 
I think is that it's a direct uh, uh, direct correlation to what I was just describing, basically. I think some people have it skewed, like some organization want to create mass, right? More people in their club means more money, but mm -hmm. at the expense of quality. But I think if we go back to the roots and we create quality, it's going to attract more quality and therefore there's going to be more mass, which will be able to sustain the business. So I think in some way, you know, we, we lose track of like, what Rachel was talking about, like our core values and sticking with that, right? So now we're, we're kind of like going with the wind and it's not, as a club, we're not building the reputation that we should, you know, attracting the personnel that we should because we're a little bit catty, catty wampus, I guess. <laughs> and to me, it comes from the top, you know, it's Absolutely. our federation that has allowed for this uh, uh, business model to become the norm and you know if our leaders allow it allow it to continue uh, then we can complain that our national team uh, mm -hmm. our men national team cannot make the world cup you know that's mm -hmm. a direct uh, result of that i agree with that and i think like you know i'd say back in my day back in our day <laughs> you know <laughs> back in it was wednesday hey. uh, uh, yesterday you know, yeah <laughs> like <laughs> like i was and i was on um I was saying this uh, last week um, that it was just like if, even if you were part of a you know a club team a travel team it was just one team and that was tr like you were trying to work hard for that team and get those right players mm -hmm. in turn you got the right players that were fighting for each other right you understood t true teamwork you understood two res true respect coaches like you were just like you would never talk over the coach you wouldn't be doing you know TikTok dances in front of them you wouldn't be not coming to virtual trainings that we're seeing now you know there was a lot more of just true grit and definition and mm -hmm. those that wanted it you would see and and you could see the divide now it's kind of like here where you know if you don't make this one team guess what there's another acronym team that you could join and there's an ac another acronym back in the day you couldn't just jump around and that was kind of like a you know red flag but now because people are coming full circle like we a lot of coaches and organizations they need numbers mm -hmm. so they just are like that's fine you know if she could she pass like let's see you know like let's see how that works and then it's just another number and then i think that's what's happening like you know you talk about the money you talk about the men's side like i think we can see that in the men's national team they're not they're not getting you know better and i think it's because you know it starts from the top Mm -hmm. And also from the bottom, can this and this both be better that they're both meeting halfway of demand that you're actually getting the right personnel, that you're actually getting the right things. And I think that would actually develop coaches better too, because it's like, I have these high quality players. I have to show up because I think sometimes uh, we, uh, players forget that they can motivate coaches as coaches motivate them. And that's kind of that, like, you know, bond that it used to be. And I don't mm -hmm. think that it's like that anymore. And there's, it's kind of spread out. But not all the best players are playing together. And not all the best coaches are in the same organization. And it's just kind of like, hey, you know, whatever. There is a lot of this whatever mentality with too many people. Um, like even when you take a course uh, these days, it's kind of like all over the place. Um, you know, there's not a lot of field exercises. There's not a lot of field work. Uh, there's not as much instruction or sharing or um, I was talking to somebody recently uh, that I, I think actually might have been Lou probably uh, that a lot of the coaches uh, you know I think one of the most important things with coaches is to be able to share amongst each other amongst us um, how we're doing things and share knowledge share because you know some you know Manu has done it before so I was like hey Manu what do you think of this or Rachel or Lou or whoever all of us uh we can bring something to the plate we have we all get stumped on something right uh mm -hmm. we don't always have the right answer for whatever the problem we may have on a team um and I find that a lot of times one of the big issues I find in the U.S. is that there's very sh there's not a lot of sharing it's like everybody's Pep Guardiola and they don't want to tell, oh, I, I can't tell you what I just did. You know, even though soccer is a ball to nets and we got to score more goals than the opponent in the end of the day. Um, right. Do you guys find that or do you guys find that there is more collaboration than uh, maybe I have seen? Depends on uh, when you got through your licensing courses. 
<laughs> because there was a time where, yeah, it was uh, the, the, the sharing and the work, the working together was encouraged. And that, that, that philosophy has changed uh, and now it's very close to what you just described. What I find shocking, to be honest, is not even the one approach versus the other. What I find uh, shocking is that the approach has changed at least five or six times in the last 15 years. And then I can tell for sure, because when I did my D license, it was a certain approach. When I did my C license, it was another one. When I did my B license, it was yet another one. And I've talked to several coaches, coaches that work for me, for my club or colleagues from other clubs that have gone through the licensing courses in the last 10 years. And every few months, every few years, the whole philosophy and the whole curriculum changes, the methodology, the terminology. I have a friend who did his C license a couple of years ago, and at the end of the course, he was told by the instructors, by the way, everything we touch in this course is going to change completely in the next few weeks because the Federation is implementing a new curriculum and a new philosophy. And that to me is one of the biggest problems we're having in this country. There is still a huge, there is no identity. We have no soccer identity in this uh, in this uh, country. And if I could understand that in 1995, 1996, when I started coaching, right after the 94 World Cup, uh, MLS just starting out, you know, soccer exploding in this country, obviously that was the time where, okay, we don't have an identity, let's, let's build it, you know, let's create it. Now in 2020, which is what, 24 years later, I find it a little harder to understand, you know? I think it's a major um, failure, for lack of a better word, of this federation that we still have not been able to identify a philosophy, a, a culture that, okay, this is what we believe in, now for the next 40 years we're gonna do this, and this is what is gonna take us to get to the next level. Right now we're, and we're getting progressively further and further away from the goal, from the end line. I think we are uh, uh, in shambles, to be honest, uh, in the last few years. And this to me is, is, uh, is shocking. It's really hard to... Uh, Many, I have a question for you. So you're saying that like the change in Federation, which I agree with you with your perception and of what that means. I, I think I agree with you. But don't, wouldn't you agree though, in some sense that like, if an organization is growing, change must occur yeah right so so i think that if a federation does not change over the course of 24 years i think there in my opinion there is some lack of evaluation because as times are changing i think there needs to be you know adaptation to the times adaptation to whatever kind of children that we have now because that's changing tremendously right etc cetera, etc cetera. so then my question to you is how would you like the Federation in the US doesn't really necessarily have a philosophy that they've maintained. I agree with that. But how would you see, or what is your opinion on a Federation changing or as opposed to keeping its absolute core or everything the same for X amount of years? So what would be your thoughts on that? Well, I have two thoughts about that. My first thought is that to me, change is good when it's a change for the better. Okay. And my opinion right or wrong we seem to be changing a lot for the worst or making changes for the sake of changes this is something that i've seen uh, my opinion again i could be wrong with this uh, and that's number one number two my personal feeling is that we had it right between roughly 2000 to 2010 those were the years where, for example, when I did my C license in 2005, the approach was we need to become better on a tactical level. We need to catch up with the rest of the world. In 2009, when I did my, uh, my B, or 2007, what was that? Yeah, 2007, I believe. Uh, the approach was already changing. The approach was, okay, now we've caught up with the rest of the world on a tactical level. 
we need to develop the next mm. Ronaldinho, the next Messi, the next Cristiano Ronaldo. We need to develop a world-class player. But the approach was going hand in hand with what was, was done before. Basically, the approach was, okay, everything we've done on a tactical level up to this point mm. is good. We're going to keep that. Now we need to focus a little bit on developing a, a world-class a superstar. So there seems to be a, a, a level of continuity. We seem to be going in the right direction. And those were the years where the men's national team, and again, I use the men's national team as a... Um, as an example, not because I, uh, you know, I don't think that, so first of all, the women are doing fantastic. And although I think it's going to get harder for them to maintain the level of success mm -hmm. because the rest of the world is investing heavily in, uh, in uh, women's soccer, mm -hmm. but I do not think that the success of the women is representative, is representing well what's going on in the world of soccer. I think the men's uh, the men's uh, trajectory instead is a little more representative of what was going on. And what was going on was that in the mid to, to, uh, 2000s, we had overcome Mexico. We, were, we had become the best team in CONCACAF. We were going mm -hmm. to the World Cup all the times. We were making the quarterfinals. We were beating major countries. And I felt that that was the result of a philosophy that was working. After 2000, 2012, what I've seen is what I described earlier, changing for the sake of changing. I did not see an improvement. I did not see okay. a, To me, changes, uh, um, they seem to be justified by changing personnel. Oh, we hire a new director. We have to change everything. It's almost like, uh, hey, if you get a, a, this job, you need to change everything, otherwise your salary is not justified. We, you need to prove to us why we're paying you. And, and that to me is not a good reason to, to change. So again, my impression, my opinion, I might be wrong about this, but my impression is that in the last 10 years, we made a lot of changes that were not based on a real need to improvement, but were more based on changing for the sake of changing. And so as a result, the men's program is becoming worse instead of better. And hey, you tell me a world-class player that we have produced in the last 10 years. Yeah, we have Pulisic that plays in, a, in Europe at a high level, but I hardly consider Pulisic uh, the product of the American uh, soccer program. You know, he's of a European uh, uh, descent, you know, European parents, so he moved to Europe very early in his career. I would like to see a player that plays youth soccer in America from 7 to 17 and at 18 is starting for Real Madrid. That's what I would like to see. Mm. And I think we're going further, further away from that than we were 15 years ago. So yeah. I hope I well, answered your question. Those are great points, and I think the big the I love what you said. I think the big word that's that should be in there too too is uh, is consistency. I think that that's the part of the change that is that's irritating because we are constantly changing, and as you're saying, like changes to make changes. I for one see that so much in my organization. It's just like here we go, here we go, here we go, and I think uh, I do believe change is needed sometimes. But I also agree, agree with you because there's we're lacking consistency. It's mm -hmm. just like, and I think it has to do with what's going on in the world right now. It's just, it's like, what's the new thing? What's the new right. thing? What's the jump? It's the microwave. And and the ADD is off the wall where it's like, oh, okay, well, I need this. I need this. Oh, this is happening. Oh, they have this new thing that's essentially an old thing, but we're going to touch and it's a reaction. And I think that there's, um, there's no solution or merit to these changes, back to what you're saying, we're just changing to change. So you'll like, let's take it from like a physio physiological, like you see people talking about, Hey, you don't need to squat anymore because of this, because of this science, because of this science, because of this science, there's all these opinions that kind of waters down the facts. And I think that's happening in soccer too, which is what's happening with the coaches. Like, Hey, I learned this. So this is what I'm going to do. Hey, I learned this. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah. I learned this and this is what I've been taught in this class. But this organization learned this, so we're going to go with this. And I have no kind of background. So, again, it's just not consistent. Everything's jumping around. And I think it's tough for a coach, too, because we're in a different light. Mm -hmm. um, 
we have to, we're coaches because and we're successful in our re regions and, you know, whatever we're doing because of what, you know, what we've done, what we've used as experiences. But as what you're saying, Manu, we're in classes and they're saying, this is going to be for naught. And for me specifically, like I, I am a person of like, I don't care if we win or lose. I want you to become amazing people because that's mm -hmm. the number one thing we'll learn out of this. Yeah. And how is your mindset? You know, people people don't focus on the uh, the psychology of the game as much as they should. Mm -hmm. So you're pushing so much about, hey, you're technical, you're tactical. Are you doing this? Are you doing this? But well, we don't know if they really want to. And mm -hmm. organizations aren't really focusing on that because guess what? It's coming full circle again. This is a business. We have to do this. You know, we don't have time for this. This is minutia. And again like it's just okay well that's not going like screw that plan what's a new plan what's a new plan and you know essentially people are getting lost in this limbo of what is this and i think that's not just per organization that is for u.s soccer 100 percent. you know and now the, a great thing to use as an example is the da is gone quick thing is that mls comes up with this thing mm -hmm. why not take a second why not take a second to figure out what's really lacking why are we not creating all six why like i would not just say on the men's side it's the same thing for the women's side you know all these top top clubs you know i would say that even you know like you said uh Manu, like success of the represent uh, success of the women's national team is not representation of the you know world soccer and the growth i will 100 percent agree with that because there's so many girls that i coach now that are 15 and they sometimes don't have the talent of, of an eight-year-old but there's a lot of girls in the nwsl that don't have the talent of a, of a girl that is also an eight-year-old you know there's a lot that is kind of missed and and uh misguided that there, again there's like no guidance and we argue for certain things because we see this one thing but again no consistency is there um i think to expand on what you guys are saying uh the lack of identity of how the u.s are supposed to play whatever that is uh, like for example we all know how the dutch play we all know how the italians play we all know how the Germans play, right? We know how the British play. Uh, they have an identity. Now, does that mean that their federations are perfect? Oh, of course not. They're as much a disaster as the U.S. are probably, well, for different reasons at least. Um, but at least they never veer off when they are successful from their yeah. core, from their heart, from their basic uh, identity of what they do best. Like, uh, I was just... I just finished reading a book by Cruyff and he was talking about how he laughs or well, when he was alive, uh, at the fact that people in other countries are trying to imitate the Dutch and he doesn't understand why would you do that? You do well, something else. You are never going to be like us. Now, does that make what happens in Italy any worse? No, it's just Italians do something else incredibly well. Uh, and that's what they teach. Um, and you see that in the, in the federation courses that you'd learn there versus here. Um, is that, and I think within that, you can make changes. You can make variation. Uh, you can be uh, elasticity of mind, which we need to have more of, I think, across the board, not just in the U.S. Um, but we do need to establish, I think, an identity. Who are we as a nation? of soccer here in the US, because right now we don't. Uh, you hear coaches spewing, you know, stuff like uh, build from the back or possession play or 4-3-3, you know, they all like the, the, the in terms or I want my six to play like this, whatever they mean, because half of them don't even know what that means. Um, can we really get to an identity though when we have so many people cooking, but we don't have one chef. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult because, again, as I said earlier, I think we're going away from what you just described instead of getting closer. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen is a fitting analogy, in my opinion. Um, we don't have a leadership. Uh, you know, this needs to come from the top. We need to have a leadership that believes in a philosophy and that is willing to invest 
into that philosophy for many years to come. You know, all the countries that you mentioned earlier, and the two of us come from one of them, what we have is traditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a tradition. We we play, uh, you know, we've been doing it for 100 years, for more than 100 years, all of these countries. And obviously, I guess uh, time, uh, the, the, the timing factor is uh, it's not the same here in this country. Oh, soccer has exploded much later. Uh, it's hard to find a solution. We need to find somebody which, in my opinion, should be a former player. You know, I, I, I don't believe we're going to create an identity and a philosophy as long as it's business people who have never played the game who are trying to find ways to implement this, uh, this philosophy. I would like to see a couple of former uh, women's uh, World Cup champions, Mia Hamm, or somebody like that. I would like to see a couple of players that play professionally uh, in Europe. Um, Dempsey, Donovan, whatever. You know, I would like to see some former players who have experienced international success who have, any, who have experienced uh, what it means to play pro in Europe trying to come up with a model a model that you know the federation decides okay this is the model this is the philosophy this is our identity let's stop copying what everybody else is doing mm -hmm. and let's do it for the next four years it has to be a long-term process what I'm seeing right now is a change of philosophy every two years. Ooh, Germany won the World Cup. Let's do it like them. Oh, uh, you know, what's the next country? Uh, Spain, uh, possession. Everybody has to be like Guardiola. You know? The flavor of the month will not allow us to create an identity. And this is what I'm seeing right now. The flavor of the month is like, ah, let's do it like them. You know? So it's difficult. I don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna happen, but I would put it in the hands of people who have played. Definitely, the business people are not leading us the, down the right direction, in my opinion. That's true. Um, let's move on a little bit to more actual coaching things because I think one of the some of the big problems connected to what we've been talking about is that because we can't really focus on development because of the business part. Uh, as coaches, you also probably often caught into that in between. Like, I want to coach from my, uh, uh, which I call it, my core values. Like Rachel was mentioning earlier, I want to really help these kids. I want to give them everything, like Lou was talking about too, and Manu as well. So how do we? But you know, coaches are stuck having to recruit, right? You have to recruit. You have to recruit. You have to recruit. If not. The, your parents drop you, players leave, um, stuff like that. So how do we as coaches um, work within that parameter, which unfortunately it's where we are right now, uh, and try to balance what we think is the best thing for these kids versus, well, crap, if I don't win enough games, I'm going to get canned. And if I get canned, I don't have money. So how do we do that? Is it too much pressure on the coaches to live like, to work like that? That's a I think you gotta find question. the right environment. But, you know, like, uh, cause I have been on both sides. I've been on the side of, hey, we like, we need to win. And, and if we win, then this is good. And like, whatever, we don't really care about anything. And that's tough for me because that's not my philosophy. Mm -hmm. But I think that's an important thing to keep in mind because it's kind of like when you pick your, college I always tell my players like pick a college that 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 you, like you're a good fit for them but they have to be a good fit for you and that's mm -hmm. the same thing as a job too like you're not going to get your vocation you're not going to reach your ceiling and they're not going to get the best out of you that way so I think it's important to consider you know what that's not really like what I'm about I need to go to somewhere where that fits my mold um because, you know, again, like I, I've been on the one that it's like, I've done a lot better where they're saying, hey, you know, you played, you did this, like, can you develop these kids? And then you can see, like, and, and, the, and the DOCs and the directors and the CFOs, they're, they're involved and they know the game. They can see that these teams, mm -hmm. yeah, well, guess what? We're not winning. 
when we were losing eight nothing, and now we're losing one nothing to the same team. And you could see that these these players are actually getting they're getting better. They're more invested. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and I think one thing that as a coach that you could do is that essentially I think especially in America, it's not the lack of resources, it's the lack of resourcefulness. So if we can push the the players and, and coaches and ourselves to actually do the homework and actually put them like guide them into these things, then they can actually get the education in the brain and they'll know which way to kind of go. And I think even coaches, they don't even know how to advise. So you're like, some of these girls don't even watch the game. So you're already like hitting a, that's it. Like it, this is here, but they're here. And it's just kind of, it's just, that's what it is. So it's us for us to push ourselves, but us, us to push that upon others, if that makes sense. I think you're absolutely right. That if, if you want to coach in the right environment, you have to go out, out there and look for it because there are so many different clubs with so many different philosophies and often with philosophies that just don't, uh, um, don't align with your philosophies and you have to decide, will I take just any job and just do what they ask me to do, even though that's not my philosophy or where will I really go out there trying to find what, what fits uh, my beliefs. Right. What is a shame is that, it is that hard to find something that that has the right philosophy you know there should be a lot more clubs with from what i understand we seem to be pretty much on the same page from what we believe is the right approach there should be a lot more options out there and then instead we're in a system that allows for anybody to just wake up one morning and saying hey i'm gonna start a soccer club and i'm gonna do it this way because that's what I believe is right. Yeah. And then that obviously is, uh, you know, limits your choices, that's for sure. <laughs> Another one that I think a lot of coaches um, we all have to deal with is, especially where we're coaching youth, is the fact that most, more often than not, you don't really have a choice of how much talent you have on your team versus, you know, the level of who... Uh, you know, you have a team of whatever, 10, 12, 15 kids, maybe seven of them are great, the rest are kind of eh. So as coaches, how do we work the two? Because obviously the ones who are really talented, in whatever that means, at eight years old, they are growing at a faster speed than the ones who are kind of still figuring it out. So how do we do it? Uh, how do we make it interesting for them? In my opinion, I don't know that there is like a full answer to that. I think to me, if I'm taking like my experience into coaching is like, I think you need to get to know your players by knowing your players, you know, what stimulates them. Right. And if you're creating your environment by the philosophy that you believe in. So for me, it's a team environment, right? So kind of like Rachel was saying to instilling good values. So if you can marry that in, in terms of giving kids responsibility that they know, I mean, they can see that they're better than some other players, but responsibility and creating positive camaraderie that where we're growing together as a team, instead of creating division of skill, like the people that are the cream of the crop are gonna keep rising. Eventually, they're not always gonna be on that same team. But when they're first coming into you, I think the values that you instill in them, and instead of saying, oh my God, this person's not good, it's kind of like, hey, that person's my responsibility. What can I do to make that person better? I always tell my players, like, make your teammate look good. If you make a pass, if I'm passing to Rachel and I'm passing 15 yards to her right side and she has to bust her butt to get there, I'm not making her look good, right? So it looks bad on her. And people are like, oh, Rachel can't get there. But no, that's my fault, right? So make your teammate look good. So I think it depends on the coach and their coaching style. But I think if you create an environment where players have responsibility for how their teammate look on the field. I think that helps bridge that gap from the disparity to whoever is better. That's my opinion. You know, Rachel is just slow. Right. Rachel's just slow. Just Rachel slow. is just slow. slow man. <laughs> I, I <wish>. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a really good point to be honest. Cause I always say like when I teach the girls, I tell them, Hey, when you pass the ball, mm -hmm. Why do we pass? Mm -hmm. Like it's it, let's start enhancing the why. Why do you pass? Mm -hmm. It's to to release pressure, right? But you want to set your team for success. We want to mm -hmm. we want to go forward, right? We want to right. win, right? Quote unquote. We want right. to score. So if you see the person's giving this run, you got to be accountable on that mm -hmm. pass. So I think that that's like a hundred percent. Like make give. I always say give the ball. Give a ball that you would like to get. Yeah. I like like, like literally. It. I'll take the ball and I'll wail at him, and I'm like, did you like that? <laughs> 
<laughs> like, I, dude, I call that an American pass. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like, it's like one of those, it's like, I call them hospital balls. You're like, what is this? Yeah. Like, it's crazy. So I think that's great. And I also think what you said about understanding your players is huge. And, mm-hmm. um, I told, uh, I said this last week, uh, to somebody, I forgot who it was, but th- there was a disc test, the DISC test that, that players and coaches do take. And it shows, uh, you how they respond mm-hmm. in situations. Like, mm-hmm. Do you respond well to being yelled at? Do you need to be caught a little, a little bit? Mm-hmm. Are you a fast learner? Are you a slow learner? Um, you know, like, or do you get, you have a, a growth mindset? Do you have a fixed mindset? Mm-hmm. These things will help you. And then if you could figure out as a whole, if you see everyone individually, like you get your individual relationships, but if you see everyone's mostly motivated by this, mm-hmm. then as a coach, you could do a better job and sure. you'll get success out of them and vice versa because unanimously you see where, what direction they're going, where they're growing. But if some some people are like not motivated at all and some people are there and you're flipping the switch of how to motivate you're not mm-hmm. going to get there so i think that's really a really good point you have to understand your players and your your uh demographic i agree and to kind of hop into what you said too just to kind of add on to like a lot of times like the um like knowing your players as i was saying is super important but the it's like the gap between how they respond to you and they like as a player their first instinct is to please the coach right so what are they seeking they're seeking for approval they're seeking for acknowledgement yes. so it depends on how like maybe i like to be yelled at kind of like what you were saying but right. if if you as a coach can give genuine reward for behavior like recognition yeah. and you know yeah. and it creates a sense of like now i want to learn more i want to keep doing the right things right. and at first they're not they're thinking i want to keep doing the right things because i want to please the coach but eventually because i'm doing the right things because this is the philosophy of the team and yeah. i'm in a safe environment to make a mistake and i think that that becomes super important for players to grow yep i know that uh, some of you have to go so do we have any final thoughts on how to fix it all for everybody and make the perfect uh, the perfect world of soccer coaching oh god <laughs> final that's thoughts. like a million dollar question yeah, yeah if i knew if i knew it yeah, seriously uh, she's like i don't think i'd be coaching six teams right now <laughs> <laughs> let me write it down so i can I'd patent the, the thing no. malibu just hanging out right right <laughs> yeah Make sure you have like some like friend units because I'll come visit. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Are we, okay, so let me put it this way. Do you think that we can get there? Do you think we can get to a time where we can make things better? Here's my opinion on this. I think that as coaches, I mean, obviously we're all here discussing the same thing. So we have very similar core values. Now, I think our job as coaches and as like influencers is to plant the seed. Right. So the people that we're coaching now are eventually going to be, some of them are going to be in the coaching industry as they're growing. So I I don't think it's possible for one sole person to change everything. But I think that like our immediate impact and the, the kids that we're coaching, I think can make a bigger ripple effect. And I think that as we keep influencing and people get more aware, uh, coaches get more aware of their role and actually the, their impact, I think that we can be more cognizant into the t- decisions that we're making and we can make a bigger impact on the youth that we're training. That's my opinion on that. I like that. I do believe, uh, you know, we're all making an impact uh, on an individual level. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to lose faith in the ability of, uh, of our leaders to take us in the right direction. Mm-hmm. But definitely we do have the ability on an individual level to make things better. And uh, if hopefully we'll get to uh, eventually a system where every coach will take this ability to make things better on a smaller level uh will take that and make it a personal mission you know uh because uh you know you can change things one little step at a time mm-hmm. you know and uh, i do come from a country where like we were talking like we were saying before uh, traditions and continuity and chemistry chemistry is something we didn't touch up on today yeah. you know this big uh, recruiting, recruiting, open tryouts, change, move, this and that, mm-hmm. you know, we're not building teams based on chemistry anymore. Right. 
and right. chemistry, I think, is one of the biggest yeah. factors Huge. in this sport, you know. Mm-hmm. So hopefully one step at a time, you know, we're all doing what we can to make things better and hopefully, uh, you know, our leaders will start recognizing that with a united uh, and strong philosophy uh, that is going to be applied uh, on a long-term level, uh, we're going to go in the right direction. It worries me when I see the federation implode the DA, not for the right reasons, in my opinion, uh, because the DA, in my opinion, on the boys' side and, and on the girls' side, even more actually, was really a failure. You know, it was something that uh, needed to go away, but they took it away because of financial reason or with mm-hmm. the excuse of coronavirus, and then they allow immediately to MLS to come up with something that is going to be inevitably a more watered down and less competitive version of the same. So can I really say, oh, finally the Federation understands uh, what they did wrong and are they going in the right direction to fix it? Not really. You know, I'm not too confident uh, about that. But at least I know that I will continue in my own little thing, you know, with my own little thing to continue to do what I think is right and continue to instill the passion and the knowledge that, you know, all three of us, all four of us seem to recognize is uh, is the right direction. And that's what definitely we can continue to do. Okay. Well, thank you all so, so much. And kind of like everything we talked about is also kind of like the reason why we're making this movie, because Mm -hmm. it is about one player at a time, hopefully one family at a time. And then we build from there, because if we don't do it at our level from the bottom up, I... I really don't believe that it's ever going to happen from the top down. Um, we have to force the issue. We have to keep pushing and make changes and make it better. And if we do that, I really do believe that eventually, just like anything else, it takes time. We might eventually see something different. At least I hope so. I got to get off. But it was really yeah, yeah. nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, Rachel. Bye. Good we'll job. talking to you. Bye. Yep. Bye. Thank, thank you both. Thank you all. Um, I know we can go on talking forever. There's so many things, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to talk to. Uh, but hopefully we can do it again and we can do it and we can talk about it next time. So thank you guys. Uh, be safe out there and we'll talk soon. Awesome. Manu, it was thank a pleasure you. meeting you. Joel, thanks Same for putting us together. Nice meeting yeah. you. We'll chat Let's soon. Let's talk soon. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.